Okay, guys, we are going to begin our first introduction introduction to biochemistry. This is our first lesson, and there is no reading that is going to be accompanying this uh, lecture. I'm just introducing the concepts to you, uh, especially in the realm of performance, skeletal muscle, cardiomyocytes, things that are relevant to kinesiology um, and, and relevant to pathophysiology because we know that we can essentially reverse and arrest diseases with exercise. Um, so let's get into our lecture one. As you guys can see, I did turn off the video. Um, I, I want you guys kind of focusing on the screen and less on uh, my shenanigans. So let's begin our first lecture. Welcome to biochemistry. So what is biochemistry? Well, essentially what we're going to be looking at in this course are molecules and how they react chemically. And, and in a regular biochemistry class, um, we would look at these reactions in multiple different type of systems, being different types of uh, creatures, different types of life forms. But we're going to be looking at it through the lens of exercise. And we're also going to be exploring the molecular components of biochemistry. So molecular and biochemistry and molecular biology are very, very closely related to one another. And we're going to look at how we can apply, apply these principles and these methods of chemistry and biochemistry um, to look at molecular structures, which are going to be your genes, uh, but also the structures that the genes create through transcription and translation, which would be protein. So we're going to be looking at gene expression, protein expression, and how genes and proteins change metabolism in favorable or unfavorable ways. Uh, since we're going to be looking at this through the lens of exercise, we want to think about how uh, the exercise stimulus is going to favorably change that cellular environment so that we can be faster, stronger, more explosive, uh, or have greater endurance. Whatever the, whatever the adaptations we're trying to obtain uh, is going to first happen at the gene. So um, in order to understand this, we have to have a, a knowledge of chemical structures and biological molecules. We will talk about some of those. I do need to introduce them to you, uh, or we're going to call them biomolecules. If you've had uh, organic chemistry, you are well aware of what these things are. If, if it's been a while since you've had organic chemistry, um, it will kind of give you a, a refresher. And if you've never had it, it's okay. We're going to go slow and uh, we'll, we'll get you there. And we got to understand uh, the biological functions of these molecules. So we're going to see how the biomolecules and how they function are going to basically increase the ability of bioenergetics in the human body. And bioenergetics is basically metabolism, how we make energy, how we make ATP, how we utilize ATP, right? So we have the molecules. We have how the molecules are going to function or interact with things, and we'll talk about this in a bit more detail momentarily. And then how does the increase in expression of genes being turned on, genetic expression, how does that result in an increase in protein expression? How does that change the cellular environment within a tissue, in this case within skeletal muscle? And then how does that change energy, both energy uh, energy intake and energy output. Okay. Um, why do we study biochemistry? Well, for some of you that want to go into uh, medicine, some of you that want to go into a PhD, some of you that want to be physical therapists or occupational therapists, some of you that want to be physician assistants, uh, you will have to understand biochemistry on a, a very complex level. Um, those of you that are going to go into strength and conditioning, you won't need to understand uh, this science on that type of level because we're just more focused with getting the results and performance, but it's going to help you to understand what's changing uh, under the hood. So that under the hood being within the muscle uh, when we apply exercise stimulus. And of course, uh, for those of you that are very into nutrition, I thought I would put this in there as well. Uh, biochemistry plays a major role in the development of herbicides and pesticides uh, and transgenic crops. But not only does it play a role in uh, these chemicals that we put on crops to basically destroy 
uh, small little insects, but also when we ingest these herbicides and pesticides, it changes our biochemistry negatively or unfavorably as well. So we use biochemistry to increase food production uh, to get better yield on crops. But the irony is that uh, when we digest those crops or we eat those crops uh, that have these biological molecules on them, uh, they alter our biology as well. So um, just to give you guys a just a taste of how I'm going to run this class, I'm always going to stop uh, when I get a few slides in and I'm going to draw for you because I want to give you guys images to help kind of tie these things together. So let's take a look at drug design. Let's look at medicine and how biochemistry works in designing drugs. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some biochemistry in the delivery and uh, the designing of certain drugs or medication. And we're just going to say that this is medication A. Um, so most drugs are designed to be absorbed within the small intestine. So you can see here, I drew this wonderful sketch of the small intestines, and that's located right here. Let me just make sure this is all working. It's located right here. We have the small intestines. And then on this section right here, I'm just saying that we just kind of are zooming in on the small intestines. So we're kind of doing that 200 time magnification. And if we zoom in on the small intestines, we, we notice that um, there are these microvilli in the small intestines that essentially look like they look like this, right? So we have this, these kind of finger like projections that um, project out of the small intestines. And if you just follow my pen like this, and we call these things villi, and they're like little fingers um, that basically increase the surface area uh, within the small intestines. And by doing this, we also design these things called crypts, which are kind of these regions down in here, which is where we increase the surface area of the small intestine. So this is what the inside of it looks like. And then we also, we also have the same thing kind of projecting down. Let me fix this kind of projecting downward like this. So that's the inside of the small intestines. And this is the space here where we have things that are going to be absorbed into the body. And that absorption is going to happen within these cells right here. So I have these little circles here. We have these cells here, which are your epithelial monolayer. And these are a certain type of cell called epithelial cells. Now, by no means am I going to grill you on this within a quiz question, but I'm just trying to show you the concept of how biochemistry works. So if we zoom in once again, let's just kind of zoom in here. Okay. And we zoom in and we come down here. This is what that epithelial cell monolayer kind of looks like, right? So we have these, I'm just going to put EC for epithelial, epithelial cell. Okay, EC, these are the individual cells. Okay, <clears throat> now when we consume a pill and we take that, we ingest the pill, the medication, uh, the pill has to get into the body somehow. Uh, and that's part of the drug design. They have to figure out how are we going to get this drug into the bloodstream, into the system. And if you can see these villi here, they have... Um, let me get a highlighter. They are heavily vascularized. So I kind of drew this image here, right? You could see oxygenated blood here, and you can say deoxygenated blood here in the blue. And that's where we're going to get the medication into the bloodstream and get it to where it needs to go. So it has to get through this epithelial cell layer first. So what happens is we eat, a, we, we consume a pill, some type of medication, and it gets down to the small intestines and it's got to figure out how to make its way into the body. Well, as a biochemist, we know that some types of substances or molecules, as I just mentioned in the previous slide, it can get through that just through passive diffusion, right? It can just kind of make its way in there, make its way in there, and then get into the bloodstream. As you can see here, let's just say we have some medication right here. 
it passively diffuses through those epithelial cells, gets into the bloodstream, and then makes its way where it needs to go. Some of them, some types of drugs, might require active transport. So inside of the cell, we have these proteins embedded here. And we can say this is protein A, protein B. It doesn't really matter. We're just trying to get the concept, right? And we know that sometimes this medication has to knock on that door. And then that door has to use ATP to actively transport it into the blood, right? So if we go back here to our microvilli, we can say that, let's say this cell right here has that active transport. Let's say this guy has it too, right? So medication comes up. Sorry about that. Medication comes in, knocks on the door, gets into the bloodstream. Medication here comes in, knocks on the door, gets into the bloodstream. Now it, it's going to wherever lo location it needs to go. Some of the medication will require a vesicle to bring it across. So this vesicle here will have to basically come to the top of the cell. It will take in the medication and then it will deliver it on the other side into the bloodstream. So if we go back to that microvilli, let's look down here. Let's get down into the crypts here, right? We have some cells here, cells here, cells here. And we'll say that these have the little vesicles, right? Medication comes, gets into the vesicle, gets into the bloodstream. So there's just another example. And then we have some transporters that will take excess amount of medication, right? We have all this, all this medication here, and it will move it back out just in case we have too much. We don't want to experience any, any toxicity. So here is an example of how biochemistry works when we're talking about drug design, we have these molecules, we have these cells, we have these reactions, and we also have these proteins that are embedded into cells that will either send the medication inward or kick the medication like this guy here, an anti-transporter, it will kick it back out so that we don't take too much of a medication in. So I just want to kind of draw this to show you how the concepts of biochemistry work. It's understanding the molecules, it's understanding the structure, and it's understanding the energy flow for exercise. But in this case, it's more of um, how the drug's gonna get where it needs to go. And then that's gonna impact a tissue and change how that tissue functions. So there's just one quick example of that. Okay, so now that I showed you that quick drawing talking about the concept of biochemistry. When we're looking at biochemistry and performance, we're looking at things like skeletal muscle structure. We're looking at skeletal muscle fibers, right? These are all proteins and proteins are made when genes are turned on. We're looking at sources of energy for muscle force generation. So when we have a muscle contraction, how is it contracting? Well, we know that it needs ATP. Well, where is that ATP coming from for muscle contraction? We know we're getting it through anaerobic metabolism. We're getting it through glycolysis. We're getting it through aerobic metabolism, right? So we'll get the foundation and the structure of the skeletal muscle in place. There's this architectural component and then there's this energetic or bioenergetic component. And then we have the regulation of this, of, of these components. So if we get uh, better at using glucose for energy or better at using fatty acids for energy, we have to regulate it. So we're going to need some other proteins that are going to make sure we're not using too much or too little when it's needed. And then when we start to exercise, there's going to be this metabolic response that changes all of these things, right? So this is biochemistry in the lens of um, exercise and performance. And if we have prolonged performance, that's gonna change these factors even more. So we wanna make sure that we are adapting to exercise in a way where we're building the skeletal muscle, 
we're transitioning uh, different fiber types. Let's say we're a power athlete. We start to develop more of those type 2X fibers, which are going to use a very different type of metabolism, which means if we are a power athlete, we're going to get more of these fibers. The architecture of the muscle is going to change. The source of the energy is going to change. If it's power, it's going to be more of this anaerobic. The regulation of that anaerobic system is going to change because we're going to increase, let's say, more creatine and creatine kinase if we're operating in this in this capacity here. And the metabolic response is going to be different because we're going to prolong it with these adaptations to power training. So that is how uh, biochemistry under this lens is going to work. Uh, let me move on to the next slide for you guys. move over it's not responding there we go okay so as i mentioned in the uh, drug delivery pathway section we have essentially two areas of biochemistry that we are going to study by no means is this everything but this is what i'm going to focus on with you there is a conformational segment to biochemistry and that is structure and we're looking at three-dimensional structures and arrangements of biomolecules. So what does that mean? I will show you momentarily. We are also looking at energy and metabolism, which is more of the biochemical process of biochemistry. So for example, when we're talking about conformational biochemistry and structures, I showed you four different cells the endothelial monolayer, right? I showed you those four cells. And in those four cells, they all had different types of proteins embedded in there that would take that medication in or that molecule inside the body. And we know that on one of those molecules and one of those cells, it allowed passive diffusion. On another one of those cells, it, it used... Uh, active transport using ATP on another one it used a blue little vesicle that I drew and on another one it, it kicked it out so kicking it out when I when I told you guys about kicking that molecule out because there's too much medication well that's a that's a regulatory protein and it's regulating how much of something is coming in this is why I drew that for you guys uh, and then in this sense here energy and metabolism well I drew medication and the medication was what was being taken into the body, but I'm going to show you guys in another drawing what I mean about energy and metabolism. Now, most importantly, as I hope you would have understood from the medication drawing, is this and this work together. You can't have an increase in this and not an increase in this because if we have too much of, let's say, ATP, uh, the body is going to regulate it so that we can't use it. So when the structure changes, so does the metabolism. And if I go, let me try to go back one slide here. Let me go backwards for a moment, if it's going to let me. It's not going to let me. Let me do this. Let's go here. So for example, if I want the metabolism to change, right? Anaerobic metabolism, glycolysis, aerobic metabolism. If I want these things to change, the architecture must also change. The fibers must get bigger and have a more, a greater metabolic demand. And if the fibers get bigger and there's a more metabolic demand and we increase the metabolism, that means the regulators, right? This is like mom and dad who tell you, you you can and can't do things, right? You're no fun at all, mom and dad. These also have to increase. Now, if all of these things increase, it's because the genes are your DNA. The genes are turning on certain regions to allow transcription and translation to happen, okay? So on a exercise changes genes on a molecular level and if exercise is gone if that stimulus is gone then another another crew comes in and says okay we're going to break this down we're going to break that down we're going to stop all of this from happening another group of regulators will come in and say all right we're shutting everything down exercise is gone we can't have all these adaptations 
we got to go back to what your DNA set point is. Okay. So let's just take a quick look at what I'm talking about with confirmation, biochemistry, confirmational and energetic. And we're talking about metabolism, right? Oh, geez. I'm sorry about that. Let me, let me go back. Uh, here we're looking at obviously myosin and actin, right? So we know that myosin and actin are the contractile properties of skeletal muscle. Here's skeletal muscle. And if we zoom in to a molecular level, right? We're talking about molecular biology here. We see that skeletal muscle, right? These individual uh, myofibrils, they contain myosin and actin. We have myosin heavy chains and then we have actin, right? So here is the conformational proteins. These are the structures. And we know that when we want myosin and actin to interact, if you guys don't know this yet because it's a 288, that's fine. Uh, but we, you will understand this more in exercise physiology. If we want myosin and actin to interact, we know that we need calcium. And if calcium binds to troponin and tropomyosin, which are these guys right here, the regulators, right? I told you that we have regulators. Then those regulators will basically remove themselves so that myosin and actin can bind and can contract. And also... We know that if we want skeletal muscle to contract, we need ATP. So we have the energy and we have the structural components. And we could even say that CA2, calcium, is also a regulator and an energy component because we have this uh, actin and tropomyosin and troponin regulating the interaction of myosin and actin, right? And then we have calcium regulating it. And then we have ATP regulating muscle contraction. So this is an example of how we have conformational biochemistry and metabolic or bioenergetic biochemistry all in this contraction, um, this contraction process here. That is how that works. Okay, and if we look at the next slide, we can see how metabolism and byproducts of metabolism can also change the biochemistry. So um, if we look at muscle contraction, well, we know that when the muscle is contraction, and we're just using high intensity exercise right now, it's just an example. We know that when muscle contraction is occurring for long periods of time and repetitively, uh, chronically, like let's say we're exercising for two to four weeks, these signals or these byproducts that are released as a result of muscle contraction, we have chronic and frequent influx of CA, uh, calcium in the muscle cell. The muscle cell experiences a lot of ADP instead of ATP. We know that ADP is adenosine diphosphate. We know ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So we know that when there's use of ATP, um, that also signals um, the cell to start creating adaptations. When there's a lot of phosphate floating around, that signals the cell to make adaptations. And then when we have a lot of hydrogen floating around, because let's say we're exercising, we're creating lactic acid, uh, we know that hydrogen is, is high in concentration. Well, these give the cell signals to basically start creating more proteins and start to adapt the metabolism. So for example, when we have chronic exercise that's happening for a long period of time and these things are elevated, we're not going to talk about NADH. I'm not going to worry about that right now. But when calcium is elevated chronically and ADP is elevated chronically and phosphates are just floating around uh, in this cell, where is that phosphate coming from? Well, it's coming from the ATP. Let me just draw this just in case some of you guys uh, haven't been familiarized with this yet. If I have A T P and I utilize it, well, I know that that's an adenosine head. Let me change the color here for you guys. And that adenosine head has three phosphates. I'm drawing with my right hand, so bear with me. I'm left-handed. Sorry, this looks as bad as it does. Uh, adenosine, phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. So ATP. Well, when there's muscle contraction, this guy gets cleaved 
and he floats away. And what does he float away as? He float away. He floats away as phosphate. And then we're left with adenosine one two diphosphate, right? So that's how that's how that works. And and on the next slide, I'm going to draw that better for you because that that was an awful awful drawing. But um, so yeah, so the byproducts of muscle contraction also change the biochemistry. So what happens is now the mitochondria when it receives these signals, it will start creating more mitochondria. So the the muscle will basically develop more of the mitochondria. And then the mitochondria will become one of the major energy producing uh, organelles in the body. Um, so it's important to understand that byproducts of exercise also change the metabolism and it changes it in a way where we get more favorable adaptations. So when this happens on a chronic, um, it's happened chronically, then this muscle is going to change favorably. And what I, let me just kind of go back to this slide to beat a dead horse. So if we're exercising chronically, we know that the skeletal muscle architecture is going to change. We know that the fiber types are going to change. We're going to get more, let's say we're doing more running. We're going to get more of those type one fibers that are rich in mitochondria, which means that the mitochondria in the skeletal muscle is going to increase. I'm just going to draw an arrow there, which means if the mitochondria increases, that means that our ability to use fatty acids, because that's what's used in the mitochondria, also increases. You don't need to know this information yet. I'm just going back to show you how all of this changes with exercise stimulus and how the structure of the skeletal muscle has to change with the metabolism of the skeletal muscle. All right, that's the big takeaway message here. I'm not going to ask you all these nitty gritty questions about fatty acids or any of that yet. We will get into it. This is just introducing the conformational and the bioenergetic. Uh, okay, let's move, let's move forward. Let me get here, here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these biomolecules, and we're just going to introduce this um, briefly today. So these are molecules that are created by living organisms. That's a biomolecule. It makes sense. And for our, for what we're looking at in this class, we're talking about proteins. And we know that proteins are made up of amino acids. And we'll talk about that quite a bit. And we're going to talk about lipids for the sake of exercise and carbohydrates for the sake of exercise. So these are the bio, biomolecules we're going to focus on mostly in this course. Now, if you didn't have chemistry, if you didn't have organic chemistry, it's okay. Let's just, for the most part, agree that 97% of the mass in most organisms and human beings are made up of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And for what we're talking about in this course, this is an important one. This is an important one. This is an important one. They're all important, but I'm going to show you how um, this kind of all comes together in a, in a very basic drawing. Okay. And, and basically these, these elements are the backbones of most biomolecules. Look at the picture I have here. What is this? Nitrogen. What is this? Hydrogen. What is this? Oxygen. What is this? Hydrogen. Okay, and again, we're not going to get that deep into these things. I'm just introducing it to you so that when we get to metabolism, you understand the metabolism portion a little more clearly. Okay, this is not an organic chemistry course, so I'm not going to uh, really require much of you guys to understand this. I'm just introducing it to you. If I said to you uh, on an exam, uh, what constitute for most of the biomolecules um, in the body, you would say, oh, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. That's it. If I were to put magnesium in there on a true or false question, you would say everything but magnesium. So it's nothing is going to be tricky. Nothing is going to be beyond the scope of what is in the slides here. Um, it's just really conceptual. So let me just kind of show you guys what I mean. So we're going to stop and we're just going to do a, a little drawing here. And I, I, I just want to show you how these biomolecules work. And the first one we're going to talk about is glucose. What is glucose? Well, glucose is one of the most important energy producing biomolecules 
uh, mm -hmm. in the realm of exercise physiology. And where do we get glucose from? Sugar. We get it from consuming carbohydrates and sugar. And we know that glucose is one of the primary biomolecules in anaerobic and aerobic exercise. So if we're talking about what is fueling anaerobic and aerobic exercise, we know glucose plays an important role in that, uh, in that action. So I told you that we have a couple of these um, components that make up a biomolecule. And let me just show you what that is here, right? So here's a glucose molecule. You're not going to, you're not going to be quizzed on how to draw a glucose molecule. I'm just showing you what I was talking about. Here is glucose. And we know that glucose is a six carbon molecule. So let me show you this, right? We talked about carbon. Here's one. Let me do it in black. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six carbons in this biomolecule. There are also some oxygens. Look at here. There is an oxygen. There's an oxygen and a hydrogen. There's an oxygen and a hydrogen. Oxygen and hydrogen. So glucose is made up of carbon hydrogen and oxygen. It is a biomolecule that we use for producing energy. All right. So there is the metabolic component of biochemistry. Now let's combine it with what we talked about earlier, just like I did with the medication. Let's talk about the structural component. So let me zoom out a little bit. Here is a cell. Okay, so let's just say this is a muscle cell, right? This is a muscle cell. This is the red is the membrane. In the center, I have the nuclei, right? And then I, I have a couple of things over here, here and here called GLUT4. You may know what they are. You might not know what they are. It's not important right now. It's just the concept. Okay, so we have potential energy here. And then we got to get that energy inside here. How do we do that? Well, when we're talking about glucose, we have a receptor in the membrane and the receptor is a protein. And this receptor, we're going to call this the insulin receptor. We know that for glucose to get into this cell, insulin has to bind to this receptor. And when insulin binds to this receptor, a lot of stuff happens in the cell here. There's a lot of different things that are phosphorylated and activated and turned on. But eventually what happens is insulin and the receptor is going to communicate with these GLUT4 vesicles. These GLUT4 vesicles are going to move up to the membrane like this. They're going to sit in the membrane here and they're going to bring glucose inside. So this is another example of biochemistry where we're dealing with a cell type, right? This is the cell. We're dealing with proteins or structures, right? Conformational components of biochemistry. We're also dealing with insulin, which is a signaling molecule. And we know that in order for this to get metabolized, all of these things have to interact. Now, what happens once glucose gets into this cell, what happens? It undergoes glycolysis. And ultimately what's going to happen is it's going to create something called ATP. And then we can use that ATP to exercise more. So I'm just giving you the concepts. All right. I'm just showing you how a biomolecule right here is composed of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. And in order for this molecule to be used for energy, it has to be brought in by another protein, but it has to be also signaled by a different protein. This is biochemistry. And this is, this is why 
exercise biochemistry gets very, very complex. So your big takeaway message from this is, oh, I see what he's talking about with a biomolecule made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? That's the takeaway. Oh, I understand what he's talking about with these conformational proteins, right? This receptor, guys, this insulin receptor has to be created by your DNA. There has to be a gene that says, hey, we need to put this receptor into the middle of the cell. Um, these GLUT4 transporters are also, they're put into the cell by your DNA. So when we exercise a lot, your genes turn on, your DNA says, hey, we're exercising quite a bit. Why don't we make more of this GLUT4 transporter so that when we exercise, we can bring more glucose in and we can metabolize it to make more ATP. But then when we stop exercising and that, that demand is gone, your genes say, oh, let's turn that off and let's start getting rid of some of these because if we have too many of them, it becomes dangerous. All right. That's the takeaway from that section. Now, perhaps the most important of these molecules, let me just kind of go back here. I had showed you the glucose molecule, right? We're talking about glucose, which is a carbohydrate. And then I said that generally these biomolecules are made up of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen. You saw that in the glucose molecule. Glucose did not have any nitrogen or phosphorus or sulfur. Um, but perhaps the most important um, component of any biomolecule is going to be carbon. So having said that, I want to introduce you guys to the idea of a carbon backbone. Let me make this a little bigger for you. Let's do this. Um, so I told you that glucose had six carbons. And I picked this one specifically because I just want to show you that here is glucose that I had. Oops, sorry about that. Let me go back. Here is glucose that I had showed you. Let's do a highlighter right here. And let's count one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, I told you that glucose had six carbons in it, and we're going to call that the backbone. So it's important for you to understand that when we get into metabolism, most of these biomolecules, glucose and fatty acids, are going to have a carbon backbone. And the takeaway message here is just, okay, glucose has a lot of carbons. Carbon must be important. And then, yes, it is. It's generally the backbone of most of our energetic molecules, such as sugar, such as fatty acid. Um, and what carbon is really good for is allowing double bonds to occur. Not that you really need to know that, but you can see here that there's a double bond with oxygen. And we'll see that when we get into saturated fats or, or fat, fatty acids, there's a carbon backbone as well. So again, the takeaway message is Glucose, which is a primary metabolic energetic molecule, biomolecule, and fatty acids both have a carbon backbone. It is the structure of the molecule. Let's look at fatty acids. Here is a picture of a saturated fatty acid, right? What do we see? Carbon, 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 carbon. What else do we see? Hydrogen, right? So we know that these biomolecules, carbon and hydrogen, are very important for saturated fatty acids. And when we have unsaturated fats or unsaturated fatty acids, we see the same thing. Look at the carbon backbone. <gasps> There's that double bond. Okay. And we see more carbons and more hydrogens. All right. So, uh, I, again, all you really have to understand is that these molecules have a carbon backbone and a lot of hydrogens added to them. Let's go back to glucose. Here's the carbon. Look at all the hydrogens. Okay. We go to fatty acids. Here's the carbons. Here's the hydrogens. That's it. Just understand that those are the backbones. That is the structure because when we get into the metabolism uh, component of this, you're going to have to recall and be like, oh, yes, I remember he had mentioned something about this carbon backbone. Now, another 
biomolecule that has a carbon backbone is amino acids. So here we see an amino acid and we see two carbons and then we see hydrogens, oxygens, and then what's unique about amino acids is it does contain this nitrogen group. So we did talk about nitrogen. So what sets amino acids aside from glucose and from fatty acids is this nitrogen group here and that nitrogen is going to make its metabolism very different than glucose and fatty acids. When we looked at glucose and fatty acids, there was a lot of similarities with the hydrogen and the carbon. But when we get to amino acids, it has this amine group, which is the, the um, nitrogen group, and that's going to change things, okay? But again, if I were to ask you, what is the backbone of amino acids, fatty acids, and glucose, you would say, oh, carbon. Now, um, amino acids can be metabolized and they can be broken down, especially during prolonged periods. Uh, but amino acids, uh, because of this nitrogen group, it makes them much more difficult to metabolize. Now, the other part of um, the other thing that's really important in understanding is that when we talk about amino acids, we do have an alpha carbon group, okay? And generally, the alpha carbon is the first carbon when we le read from left to right. Um, and generally, we are going to have a functional group, which is R. This is, this is representative of a functional group, which is what gives the amino acids its characteristics. And we will talk about this in detail when we get to the amino acids. The only takeaway message right now is that we have carbon backbones in amino acids. We have carbon backbones in fatty acids. We have carbon backbones in glucose. So the similarity between sugar, fatty acids, and amino acids are carbon backbones. That's the takeaway. This is why you don't need to read this week. I'm telling you what is essential. So just one more quick thing on this uh, carbon backbone that we've been talking about. Um, carbon, it's very similar to a spinal cord. So let me, let me just kind of like draw this and make it look like a spinal cord the best that I can. Okay, so we have these individual vertebrae, right? And what makes the vertebrae so complex and so long is the fact that these individual vertebrae are, are essentially bound together, right? And we have some um, spacers and some cushioning in between the vertebrae. Uh, but what happens is each one of these vertebrae are their own entity. And then when we combine them together, we have this very complex system. If you look at a human spinal cord, it looks very similar to a carbon backbone. So we have a human backbone and we have a carbon backbone. And my last thing that I want to talk about uh, on carbon in this backbone is the reason we have carbon backbones is because it allows um, molecules to be diverse. It allows the carbon to branch out and to bind to different elements uh, to create unique characteristics. So if we look at, let's say we look at uh, ribose, right? We know that ribose is a very important component of DNA and RNA, right? Uh, RNA specifically. Um, ribose, this type of sugar has one, two, three, four, five, five carbons. So it has a five carbon, uh, backbone. We know that glucose has six carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the carbon backbone, uh, although it's similar in all these different types of sugars, uh, it's, it's diversity comes from its ability to branch out and to bind to other elements. And carbon likes to bind to four different elements. So let's let's put this to the test. Let's pick this carbon, right? We have this carbon here, one, two, three, four. It binds to four different elements. Uh, let's pick this carbon here, right? So we have a double bond to oxygen. That's one, two. We have a single bond to hydrogen, three. And then we have another bond to this carbon here, right? So carbon generally likes to make four bonds and it creates diversity within the carbon backbone and diversity within the biomolecule. Um, so, so that is very important when we're talking about both macromolecules 
uh, and micromolecules. Uh, and these, these carbons, these chains here is what gives it its unique properties. Now, um, when we're talking about the, well, let's, let's look at fatty acids as well. Let's put it to the test. Let's pick this carbon. One, two, three, four. Let's pick this carbon. One, two, three, four. And if we go back to what I was talking about with biomolecules, we're generally talking about hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, right? These are the major, major players in, in biomolecules. And we know that carbon makes the backbones. Now, when we're talking about protein or amino acids, here's an example of an amino acid. And we, we know that this has a carbon backbone as well. And almost all of our amino acids have the exact same carbon backbone structure. They have, they all have an amino group or an amine group. They have a carbon backbone and then they have a carboxyl group. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but what makes the, uh, amino acids so unique, as I mentioned before, is this functional group, this R chain. And the functional group, which is combined to the carbon backbone, um, this forms chains that will basically descend downward, which will give amino acids their very unique properties. So a, this could be an H, right, which would be glycine. This could be an OH, right? This could be another carbon here. And then we can have another carbon here and another carbon here, which was what we see with some different amino acids. So this, this side chain here gives, um, gives amino acids very unique properties. And then uh, when these amino acids bind with other amino acids and they create complex proteins, uh, the side chains here will determine how those proteins fold and how they act. The behavior of the proteins will be uh, determined by what the side chains are. So that's why this functional group plays a very important role. And we'll talk about that a bit more uh, as we get into amino acids. I'm just introducing the carbon backbone story today. Um, I'm not going to go over this slide just because I kind of showed you what the functional group does and I don't want to scare you and we're, we'll talk about this as we get into amino acids. Um, but essentially, this functional group here, it, it could be any one of these. So it, it could be a hydroxyl group. It could just be a, there could be phosphates connected to it. There could be carboxylates uh, attached to it. By no means do you need to know this. I'm just showing you that when you descend from the, when you just, oh, sorry, let me go back. When you descend from the carbon backbone, you could have a variety of different uh, elements that are bound to it. And that's it. That's all you really need to know about that. So um, we're going to talk about the basic structures of biomolecules now. So we're going to talk about what they look like and act like individually. And when they start binding together, I want you guys to think of like a Lego, right? If you have a single Lego that really doesn't do, do you much good. But if you have a giant box of Legos and you start combining those Legos together, we can get something called macromolecules, which looks like this, right? So this is this is a structure of a protein, and this protein is filled with hundreds of thousands of amino acids that have bound together and are making a structure here. And this, this, this thing here, it could be an enzyme. This could be an enzyme that is in glycolysis that will make a reaction happen. Um, so how do we get from um, exercise turning on a gene to producing amino acids, to producing proteins like this that will be put into the glycolysis pathway that will help reactions happen quicker. We will, we will get there in time. Um, so, so what we're going to basically start discussing now and presenting here is just how these micromolecules and micro mean obviously small will start to combine to make bigger uh, structures. So for example, we have a nucleotide. If you don't know what a nucleotide is, it's okay. We're going to talk about it next week. Um, a nucleotide by itself is very small, but when nucleotides start binding together, we get thousands of nucleotides that bind together and we get structures like this, which are DNA. We get these very big micro or our macro molecules. Amino acids are the same story. If we have a single amino acid, it is a very, very, very small structure. But once these amino acids start binding together, they make these very large structures. Again, we make proteins. Lipids are the same story and carbohydrates are the same story. They start as individual pieces and then they combine together to form much 
big, bigger, more complex structures. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about in this last section here is, is what, what that looks like. Um, so again, basic structures can lead to macro molecules. So nucleic acids can lead to DNA. Uh, amino acids can lead to protein and a single um, sugars can lead to polysaccharides, right? So we go from small to large, nucleic to DNA, amino acids to protein, individual small sugars could lead to polysaccharides, which will make bigger, more complex structures. Um, so if we look at a nucleotide, um, a nucleotide is basically the main component of nucleic acids. Um, and it is the building block of our DNA. So a single nucleotide looks like this. It has a phosphate, it has a sugar group, and it has a nitrogen base. Okay. Now these individual nucleotides will begin to bind together. So we have the micro molecule and they will eventually begin to form a macro molecule that looks like this. That's the takeaway. You don't need to know this yet. I'm just saying that these individual things, this individual Lego here can play with other Legos and make very big structures. Uh, same thing is true with proteins. If we have a protein, this is another version of what I showed you guys before. We have uh, a carbon chain right? We have that R variable group. This is just another picture of it. We have that amine group here. These individual amino acids can bind together to make these very complicated structures, right? So we have these individual amino acids, right? Alanine, arginine, cysteine, leucine, tryptophan. These individual amino acids, which, oops, sorry, look like this, they will start binding together to make macromolecules, right? And these macromolecules will begin to take certain shapes. And the reason these shapes, this is here is an alpha helix. This is a beta sheet. The reason these proteins will begin to fold into structures like this is because, I'm oh, sorry about that, because of the property of these R chains. And you don't need to know any more than that right now. Just say that, okay, he said that there's an amino acid. They have these R chains. These R chains give the amino acid its fingerprints, or if we want to talk in snowflakes, the R chain makes the snowflake very unique. We know that there's no two identical snowflakes. The same thing with amino acids. There's no two identical amino acids. Um, these R chains will be variable. We know we have 20 amino acids, so there's 20 different variations of this R chain. And then these amino acids can bind together. Here's a micromolecule, micromolecule, micromolecule. But when these all play together like Legos, we get a macromolecule and then we get something like this. All right. So we're going from micro to macro. And what's interesting about this is if we talk about uh, anabolism and, and or anabolic reactions and catabolic reactions, the assembling of these proteins would be anabolic, right? We're creating macromolecules, but let's say that we're going into starvation or we've been exercising. Uh, we've been doing too much exercise and haven't been refeeding properly. Well, then these proteins will get broken down to be used as energy, which would be a catabolic reaction, right? So we can have anabolic, which is the creation of macromolecules, and then we can have catabolic, which would be the deconstruction of macromolecules back down to micromolecules, right? Um, so think of it that way. And that's, that's what happens when we have protein synthesis and protein degradation. So if you're thinking about exercise and protein synthesis and protein degradation, especially if we're doing strength training, that is what's happening. We will have the construction of macromolecules from micromolecules and a micromolecule in this case would be an individual amino acid. And then when we break down proteins, we have the opposite. We have a catabolic reaction where the macromolecule gets broken down into its individual constituents again. Okay. And the same thing is true for carbohydrates. So if we look at polysaccharides, I told you that a polysaccharide, which is this, this is an example of glycogen that exists in your skeletal muscle that we have as, re as a reserve of energy for exercise. We will build this 
polysaccharide using individual pieces of glucose, fructose, or galactose. So these are the micromolecule sugars, right? These are micromolecules that will bind together. Here you can see them form their own, their own backbone per se. And once these things bind together and they elongate, we get this very massive macro molecule. Okay. So this would be anabolic, the creation of it, right? So you exercise and then you go carb load, right? And as you're carb loading, you're doing that on purpose to build more glycogen in the muscles to replace the glycogen that you use during exercise. That's why we carb, carb load and we have these molecules and let's just refresh our memories here. I told you that these molecules generally have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, right? There they all are. Here they all are all in different formations. And let's just kind of go over, let's go over the carbon backbone again, because these have a carbon backbone. When we're looking at sugars, the carbon is here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So galactose has six carbons. Um, if we look at glucose, carbon is here, here. It's where the angle changes here here, here, and here. And just like what I showed you guys uh, on, let me, let me go back and find it for you uh, just so we can show you two different versions of the same story. Um, this slide here, it's the exact same thing, right? It's just a different way of looking at it. Here's glucose linearly. And then if I go back here, we know glucose has six carbons. If I go back here, um, the glucose here, this is just in its, um, in its, um, true form. This is how glucose really looks. Um, so let me erase that for you guys here, just to refresh our memories. Let me erase that. We have different versions of, of sugar, essentially. Each one of these sugars have a carbon backbone. We know that the carbon backbone is where the, where the, carbon can branch out and make different bonds, right? So if I have a carbon here, right here, I know that it's making a bond with this carbon. I know it's making a bond with that carbon, right? Cause there's another carbon here. So there's two bonds. It's making a bond with oxygen and it's making a bond with this carbon here. So there's four bonds. These individual micromolecules will bond together just like this, they make bonds with one another because anything with carbons love to bond. They love to play Legos and build themselves up and they will turn into a macro molecule. I hope that makes sense. That's pretty, that's pretty straightforward. And then when we look at nucleic acids, again, just like I showed you before, we have these, let me go back to this picture to refresh your memory. Again, there's no reading. So you, all you're really trying to understand here is, oh, micromolecule to macromolecule. These individual pieces, the in, these individual Legos can exist on their own or they can bond and exist together. So we have our uh, nucleotide here. It has a phosphate group. It has a sugar ring and it has a nitrogen base, right? If we go back to what I was just looking at here, these, here's the phosphate, here's the uh, sugar, and here's the nitrogen base, which is a different type of nucleotide. So this one is adenine right? This one is cytosine. So there's four different nucleotides as well, but look at the nitrogen base is the variable. Here's the sugar backbone. Here's the phosphate. And this individual nucleotide binds to other individual nucleotides through this phosphate, through the car and through the sugar backbone. And now we get, once these things bind together, these individual micromolecules, we get this massive macromolecule, which you guys can see right here. That's our DNA. Okay. Same sort of story. Uh, same thing with lipids. We can have a phospholipid. We could have a triglyceride. We could have a lipoprotein and these individual lipids, which are micromolecules can bond together with other lipids. Like you see here, right? Here's this phospholipids and they can make a macromolecule structure. And this would be a membrane, right? The individual piece, and then it can bond together and it can play with other individual pieces, just like Legos and make a macro molecule. We could also have protein transporters embedded in the lipid membrane. So we can have proteins, which are made of what? 
hundreds and thousands of those amino acids, which play a role in structure. And if we go back to what we were talking about earlier in the lecture, what kind of protein would this be if we're talking about biochemistry? What would that, what would that trans, what would that, um, protein transporter B, well, that would be a conformational, structural, three-dimensional arrangement of a protein, right? So that's the, that's the structure that that's, um, that's the purpose that that structure is, is uh, playing in this role, right? So, um, and then we can just go to this kind of last one is, is organelles within the cell organelles within the cell, you guys should be familiar with what they are. Um, they could be um, chromatin, they could be ribosome RNA protein, they can be cytoskeletons, even viruses, things like that. Um, these biomolecules tend to cluster together and they can form these structures. So again, lipids and proteins in the cell membrane. Chromatin from DNA, what is DNA made of? It's made up of individual nucleotides. What is RNA made up of? It's in its individual um, it's messenger RNA, which is going to basically translate into protein. Uh, your cytoskeleton within each cell is made up of protein structures. And then even the viruses that can get in, they're made up of, of proteins and, and individual little uh, DNA and RNA um, assemblies. So all of these things in the cell are, they can exist as micromolecules. They could also exist as macromolecules. And that is all I'm going to ask you guys to understand uh, for this lecture. I'm going to do a couple little drawings here just to draw, just to drive the idea home. And then I just want to make sure you got it. And then uh, this, this was an easy week. So, all right, guys, I just want to reinforce some things here, just in case you really haven't had any biochemistry or any assistance whatsoever. So I, I mentioned, um, before that, uh, these, these carbon backbones are, are very similar to a spinal cord, right? So this is my human backbone. And as each one of these vertebrae is essentially going to be a carbon, right? And we know that carbons like to bind together. So we have this one binding here. We have this one binding here. The vertebrae itself is essentially a micromolecule. And then when each vertebrae begins to bind with other vertebrae, right? Then we get this large structure, which we're going to call a macromolecule. Now, the carbon backbone, uh, carbon is always at the center of the backbones that we're talking about for this course, uh, for the sake of exercise and performance. And I, I basically told you that this each carbon likes to form four bonds, right? So if we have this alpha carbon here at the center, it likes to go up, it likes to go sideways, and it likes to go down. Um, and just to kind of get you guys used to some of the lingo here, because uh, I, I, I'm not sure if you've had this uh, type of uh, training before, but we know that uh, the carbon, each amino acid will have this alpha carbon. It will have, it will always have a hydrogen above it, or it could be below it, depends on how you're drawing it. It will always have a carboxyl group, okay? And that's going to look like this. And it will always have an amine group or an amino group, and that will have this here, okay? That's our nitrogen. Now, as I mentioned before, it will also contain this R chain, which is its variable group, right? This is what gives each of the essential and non-essential amino acids their own characteristics. And this is all I need you to know right now is, is that the amino acids will have these very similar bonds among all the uh, essential and non-essential amino acids. But it's, it's this guy right here. It's this R chain, this variable group that will change what the amino acid looks like and what the amino acid functions as. All right. Um, you will see, here's just kind of another version of the amino acid. Again, we can see that we have the, uh, the alpha carbon. It is bound to the carboxyl group and it has the hydrogen above it, the R chain below it. And here we see the, um, 
amine group, which is generally a nitrogen with two hydrogens. So you can see that there's a hydrogen here and hydrogen here. Now this gets confusing at times because sometimes you'll see this amine group as NH2. Sometimes you'll see it as NH3. When amino acids are in water, like they are in the human body, that's where we generally tend to see that NH3 because some of the hydrogens get moved around a little bit in water. You don't need to know that. All I want you to understand is if you see NH3 or if you see, sorry, if you see NH2, you're like, why is there two and why is there three? One is generally in water. It gets very confusing. Even at times I get confused by how people present that information. So that's what I want you to basically understand about the amino acid. If you, if you have done this before, great. It's an easy week. If you haven't done this before, all I really need you to understand is, okay, there's this molecule. There's a carbon at the center. There's a hydrogen. There's this amine group, which is made of nitrogen. There's this carboxyl group, which will basically help it in binding to other amino acids. So this guy here is, this guy here is going to play like a Lego piece, right? Oop, that's my Lego, right? It's going to bind to other Legos. So we'll put this guy here, right? And oops, whoa, I don't know what just happened there. Let me go back up. Sorry, my thing's super sensitive here. This is what happens when uh, you're left-handed and you're drawing on a tablet. Um, so there's another Lego. And then let's say we get another amino acid. That Lego will bind to that, right? And this is how proteins begin to make their formation. And each one of these amino acids are going to have a unique side chain, right? And that's what's going to give it its characteristics. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to review is this. We had talked about this conformational biochemistry being structural, right? And we're talking about skeletal muscle and we're also talking about cardiac muscle. So we're talking about these myocytes, right? We have skeletal muscle um, and then we have basically cardiomyocytes, right? So we have these cells that will bind together to make these three-dimensional structural um, proteins and the heart would be one of those three-dimensional structural proteins that is made of many, 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 many different amino acids, which makes a protein. And we have skeletal muscle as well, striated skeletal muscle, um, myocytes, which are again made up of many, many, many different cells bound together. This would be the conformational piece. And as I told you, the conformational piece, the conformational biochemistry also has a, a bioenergetic metabolism or an energy metabolism as well. So biochemistry can be physical, right? We could touch it, right? These things we can touch. It could also be energetic, which will be reactions. And the reactions occur within the structures, right? So let's, let's just zoom down here really quick. Let's look at, let's look at fatty acid metabolism. Okay. So if we have, let's just say we have a long chain fatty acid, looks like this, and we want to make some energy. We want, to, we want to get some ATP from this. Well, here I have the skeletal muscle cell, right? So this is the membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. We know that when we exercise, the muscle is going to change. And if that muscle changes, so does the energetics and the energy demand, all that changes as well, right? So this is just the membrane. We'll throw some, let's just throw some nuclei in here because we know skeletal muscle is multinucleated, right? So I'm just going to put N, N, N. Now you guys know from the lecture that I just gave you that the membrane is made up of these micromolecules called phospholipids. And these micromolecules all bind together like Legos, right? And they make this really complex membrane like this, right? So these things are packed in here like this, right? Here's another phospholipid. Here's another phospholipid. 
Here's another one, right? And then uh, we have it packed like this. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. There will be some cholesterol in there as well, right? And we know that this membrane, right, that looks like that, is this macromolecule, this membrane is made up of these individual micromolecules, which in this case are lipids. But I also told you that these membranes also have proteins embedded in them. And these proteins serve a function. In this case, we're going to call this protein CD36. Each protein has a name or it has a number. That's just how scientists label it. Now, we know that this protein is made up of what micromolecules? You should be saying amino acids, right? And each of these amino acids are going to have a side chain, right? I'm just going to draw these variables. And based upon what these side chains are, it's going to cause these amino acids to fold into a structure. So let's just say it looks like this. Now let's say this amino acid, these amino acids fold into this structure, which becomes a protein. And this protein is put inside of the membrane. So let's just say this is the CD36. Okay. And again, all I want you to understand is how the micromolecules are turning into macromolecules and how there's a structural component and an energetic component. Okay. So we've, we've, we've kind of identified the structural biochemistry. We have the membrane. We have the individual phospholipids. We have the amino acids, which turns into a protein, which gets put into the membrane. So we have all these micromolecules. And then we have this long chain fatty acid that we want to get into the skeletal muscle cell. Well, I told you that not only do the structure change and the energetics change when we exercise, but also the regulation. So we have these other proteins that regulate. So you should be saying, okay, structure changes when we exercise, the energy demand and how we regulate that energy changes. And then the cell will put kind of new regulators in there. It's going to build more regulators, which we're going to say are, are like parents, right? Like parents never want you to have fun. And that's what the regulators are do. They're there to say is like, okay, don't eat that entire one pound bag of peanut covered MMMs. And you're like, but I want to eat this one pound bag of peanut M&Ms. But the regulators or the parents, they know that you shouldn't eat that. So that's what certain things in the cell do. They say, don't take in that much sugar because it will be bad for what we're trying to do in the cell here. So when this long chain fatty acid makes its way uh, from the blood to the skeletal muscle, it needs to be transported in by this protein CD36. So this here is the regulator. Okay, you're no fun, mom and dad. I, I want I want a lot more fatty acids to come in, but this this protein needs to tell it, okay, slow down. I'm gonna make sure you get in the cell the right way. I'm gonna make sure you are metabolized the right way. Okay. So one of the changes that happens with exercise when we're talking about conformational and, and metabolic changes with um, biochemistry and molecular biology is we will upregulate more of these of these receptors. Or I'm sorry, of these um, proteins, which means the DNA will say, "Oh, that's it's like shock. It's shocked. Oh, hey, we have more exercise happening. We also have more of these fatty acids that are appearing." we better put more of these CD36 inside of the cells to regulate these fatty acids that are coming in. So your DNA will basically, your genes will turn on, you will produce more amino acids that will turn into this protein, and then you'll start to see more of these proteins, here's that CD36, be it embedded inside of the membrane. So now we have more regulators, which means now the cell can deal with more 
of these fatty acids. Okay, so the fatty acid can now come into the cell and then we have an enzyme or a coenzyme over here. You don't need to know the name. I'm just showing you the process. It's, a, it's an acyl-CoA. This enzyme, which acts as another regulator, it's another parent, is going to say, oh, wow, there's a fatty acid coming in here. I need to interact with it and I need to activate it. And what this enzyme does is it will basically interact with a fatty acid that has come inside of the cell and it will activate it into something called long chain acyl-CoA. And now the fatty acid has been transformed into something the cell recognizes and now it can metabolize it to create energy. All right. So I just wanted to draw you that schematic to kind of show you all these individual pieces together. You're not going to be tested on drawing the schematic. I just want you to understand that there's micromolecules that like to make Legos and, and, and make macromolecules. And those macromolecules can be membranes. They can be proteins. They can be, in this case, an enzyme. They can be, as we were talking about with the medication, remember I showed you guys that medication thing? It could be a protein that allows something into the cell. Um, when we exercise and we increase the skeletal muscle size and the skeletal mu muscle function, that could happen on a regulation level, which means we can just get kind of more of these uh, CD36s in the muscle, which will allow more fatty acids to come into the cell, right? So now we can metabolize more of them for energy. This is just a basic overview of how these things work together. And, and I just wanted to give you these little pictures to show you that, that biochemistry is, it is structural. These are made of amino acids, right? These are made of, oh, let me get a better pen. These are made of amino acids that will all bind together to make a structure. Same thing here all bind together to make a structure. And once that structure's in place, that structure can get bigger, right? Muscles get bigger. And if we don't exercise, the muscles can get smaller. We can get rid of those adaptations, right? We can make the muscle um, much smaller without exercise. And that's because regulators are tearing it down. Um, and then once we have adaptations to these structures, then we can have more metabolic changes because the structure is creating the machines that the cells need to metabolize uh, things like fatty acids and glucose. Okay, that is all I have for you guys. I just want you to sit on that for a little bit and um, just kind of think about all these things together. Um, all that you, the big takeaway is that again, biochemistry is structural. It is reaction. It is energetic. We have these micromolecules that all share these carbon backbones. And we know that carbon's important because it allows uh, these molecules to branch out and have individual unique characteristics. And then these individual things with a carbon backbone can bind to other things that have carbon backbones and make these macromolecule structures. And that's what gives the muscle and the cell its function. So I hope you guys can appreciate that. I'm going to stop there and uh, I will be in touch with you about trying to get some room space and meet with you guys face to face so we can answer any questions. I will be in touch soon. Have a great week.